And I'm always late. Says I'm live, but I'll also say I'm late. <laughs> I see the that's one of the first comments on here. Welcome to Vlog Thursday number 332, MSP Geekon debrief, PF Sense, Tech Talk, and some live QA. You know, I realize mostly it turns into live QA. And by the way, there's at least once a week a comment pops up that is post the live show asking for time indexes. If anyone's ever bored and would like to time index this and send it to me, I would be happy. I don't even know. I should probably just put it like a paid position. I, you know, eventually I'm going to need to hire some people to help me with this. Um, I just don't have time to note and time index uh, as I shift between topics. Um, but if anyone volunteers for that, absolutely. Um, at some point, I'll, I'll probably hire a person for it, but that's not today. I, I am not getting hundred million dollar offers like the folks at Linus Tech Tips, <laughs> but you know, uh, the channel does well enough that I will be hiring people eventually. That is that is on the to-do list, not just technical people who work for the tech side of things, but maybe someone on the creative side as well. I think it's time I do that. But the things we're going to talk about, and I'm going to throw this up here now because I like when the questions come in. Even afterwards, we have the vlog Thursday at LawrenceSystems.com. I will answer questions that get emailed there. I do my best to uh, gather them up during the week. And, and usually, you know, it's weird. I figured, and I was wrong about this. I thought I would get more emails than I do. I usually only get a few, uh, and which is fine. Now, I don't reply to them. I'm just gathering them in an inbox. I, well, I get some weird things sent there because people can. Um, it all just filters into a specific box and I read through them and go, Hey, there's, here's questions on there. Uh, there, there's sometimes questions people will send that I don't answer because it doesn't make any sense or I don't know what they're talking about. But for the most part, I answer uh, tech questions. I should say <laughs> there's certainly off topic questions that have gotten in there, but nonetheless, uh, MSP geek Con was amazing. Oh, cool. I got, and I met so many of you super cool interacting. Uh, I, I try to make it as clear as possible. Like, Hey, cause someone even, I was in the pool and someone had made a comment of like, well, is there, are you just chilling or you want to talk? I'm like, Oh, I, I want to talk. I'm, I'm here at a conference. I don't care if I'm in the pool. Uh, I'm not doing anything. Matter of fact, I had joked cause my friends are like, we're all going to go get in the pool. And I'm like, let's go change into, I'll go change and I'll, I'll meet you at the pool. And I was in the pool. They ended up at the bar. So <laughs> I wouldn't, but nonetheless, I like engaging, communicating with people, uh, doing the talks, putting it on. It was just an absolute blast. Um, John Hammond always is like, he knows when the camera's up, he's ready for that. Uh, you know, the big smiling face in the background, John Hammond's always funny like that. Uh, it was definitely just such a good time. The event was really well. So if you were unable to make it this year and you're wondering if you should go next year, no, the date's not set yet, but the answer is generally yes. You probably want to go jump in on this. If you're a technician looking to learn, um, I did have at least one person I met that came all the way from Austria. And uh, so I was impressed. I mean, people came from all over the place for this event. It was, uh, it, you know, kind of give you an idea. If you're wondering if there's a lot of people there, about 500 people there, most of it was the first time they'd ever been to a conference and it was just great. You had just top notch people doing talks all about education, not vendor pitches, not people trying to sell you anything, uh, just teaching people and, you know, talking about how to move like talk I did was, you know, from help desk to leadership, how you make those transitions and a lot of other people for, you know, how to be a better problem solver, how to understand the technical things, how to engage better. So it was just a lot of fun. Hmm. And my son is aware that there was um, lots of goots, not not goose, but lots of goots. There was just so many goots. Um, that's the mascot of MSP Geek. And they wanted us to steal them, I think. I feel that way. And people certainly started gathering them. There, there are um, there's photos of these being gathered from all over the place and. I think there's at least one photo I've seen pop up that is like there, there is a culmination of all of them where they got together and where are they? Hold on. I'll bring this photo up real quick here. Cause they're, they're kept, that was like in the middle towards the end. Here, there's a, bring this one up. There were more of them. They were gathered. So this kept going on and on. Uh, until they were all in one place, I guess. So it's <laughs> it's part of the fun. I mean, it's a geek conference, so you got to find the nerdy stuff. You got to have the fun with it. 
Um, it was definitely a good time. So much fun to be had. But nonetheless, I can't just rant about that. I actually want to talk about something. So uh, let's see. Oh, no, Grey Goose. Yeah. There's plenty of photos of Goots in a conference room uh, on, on the Discord channel. Yeah, join the MSP Discord channel. So even if you missed out the event itself, uh, you can still join MSP Geek. It's it's a community. This is just the event of that community. So if you are interested in joining MSP Geek and our Discord, it's a bunch of like-minded technicians. Uh, this was their conference, but you can still go to, I, is it, I got the wrong one. It's just, it's mspgeekjust.com. Or is it .org? Yeah, mspgeek.org. There we go. So you can still join um, MSP Geek itself. So this is a lot of members, 18,000 members. So definitely big. Let's celebrate an uneventful night when Zixel World is burning. Thanks for helping me ditch those boxes. Yes. Another week. Another Zyxel, Zyxel or Zyxel? I think it's Zyxel. But yeah, they, they've been on fire. I just don't like them. And especially because some of their CVEs were for back doors. And I was like, yeah, that's no, that's not something you want. You don't want a system with back doors in it, especially when they're hard coded passwords. That's why I say back door, uh, poor coding. Best way to describe that. Uh, let's jump over though. I oh, I where I'm going to be. You can find me in just a couple of weeks at IT Nation Secure. So if you see me there, hit me up, say hi, um, all that fun stuff. That's going to be in roughly two weeks. Um, let me pull that up real quick. I get the exact date so people know what I'm saying. That's going to be this event here, IT Nation here, June 5th and 5th, 6th, and 7th of 2023. That's going to be in Orlando. Uh, obviously, this is a big event that costs a lot of money to go to. It's it's not the same as MSP Geek. Uh, it's a IT Nation security conference. There'll be some good talks there. Um, but you know, definitely going to uh, be a good time. If you're in the IT space, it's a it's a neat event. All right. Next is the questions i have that people sent in and um a couple of these are interesting so let me pull this up because i don't i'm going to answer the question by going to the netgate site and go to their product page because i think the answer is if i looked here go to buy now I don't think there's an accessory or is there accessories? Yeah. So the question the person had, so now that we've got the page pulled up so we can answer the question. Um, <clears throat> the question was, do they have, if they wanted to get the uh, SG2100, can you use it with the NetGate rack mount or should you get the 4100? No, the 4100 is is probably a, is even better. 2100 is good. 4100 is a little better. The specs are in there. It's really a specs difference. But the bracket that I know of won't fit this. So this doesn't have the same mounting bracket because it's a little bit smaller than if you went to the, um, right here, the 4100. These are on a bigger piece. So these have the rack mount thing. So if you go and click on the 4100, you can then go to the accessories here and you can see they have a mount kit with it. I mean, it's up to you if you want the mount kit. I it's nice. It's a nice aluminum mount kit. I've talked about it before, uh, but it is it is kind of a little bit extra money. I do like the way it looks. I mean, we have one. I think it looks great. Um, it just for if you're a home user, you got to decide if you want to spend the extra money. But it's a nice product. It's well made. says NetGate on there, and uh, it makes it look good. How's it going, Tom? How can I policy route traffic of port 25 to a digital ocean on a node pod or VM. I have a go through the internet. Of course, the PF sets on my side, my speed blocks port 25. It's less about policy routing. It's more about probably tunneling your mail server traffic. You're well, you're trying to do out of 25. So how can I policy route out 25? Is that, is that the goal? Um, 
Because usually you can just change the outbound port so it lands on someone's 25 or are they blocking outbound. The, the If it's outbound 25, one of the easy ways to do this is use a VPN and do a policy route to say this IP. Now, I have a, a, a privacy VPN video that shows you how to do, you know, whichever one you want, whatever privacy VPN company you want. Just swap out the privacy VPN company for like a digital ocean or where or Linode. And from there, you would just have that connectivity between your PF sense in there. And then you create a policy on the uh, system as I do in that video to say this should route over this ga uh, gateway. So if you did open VPN or WireGuard, you'd set it up as the uh, gateway. So yes, it's a. Uh, Yes, it's the outbound. Yeah, you just set it up to go out that gateway. And once it goes out that gateway, you're good to go. It'll it'll push out there. And uh, it's the same as my uh, privacy VPNs. It's it's not any different at all in terms of how you set it up. It's just that you'd set it up with an open VPN server would be the one in DigitalOcean that you set up instead of insert name of privacy VPN company. Uh, but then that'll work. So you can then use it and you don't want to use a privacy VPN company because they're never on a list that will get you through an email, but hopefully digital ocean or Linode will be allowed to send email. The problem is you're still going to have a lot of spam. You're going to have to try to get it unlisted because even if you grab a random IP out of digital ocean, uh, they actually talked about this on two and a half admins. I don't know if it was digital ocean or Linode, one of those two, Microsoft just decided not to receive email from for three months. And it was a discussion they had on one of the podcasts. I thought it was kind of a funny one, but it was all those things. Microsoft just decided there was too much spam. And the way they solved the spam was they blocked large uh, blocks of IP address in range that spammers use. This is one of the reasons I don't bother with mail servers. Um, they're just not worth it because you'll end up you end up with it working until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you're really aggravated because you're like, oh, look, Microsoft decided DigitalOcean, we have now blocked you from port 25. And what do you do? <laughs> and you you can't exactly influence Microsoft. And you certainly don't have the poll DigitalOcean does. And uh, it, it's just a real challenge when it comes to setting up mail servers. It's just one of those things that, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's a it's a tricky problem. Uh, I wish you the best of luck, but that is a solution to it. Um, the next question that someone had sent in, it's actually the same person I had the uh, um, same question about this right here in terms of the uh, the brackets. They had also asked about this, and I've, I've covered this before in its own video about setting up cameras, but the question people always have is if I put these cameras on there, do they need internet access? So it says, I know some, uh, let me bring it over here. <clears throat> I know some smart home options, uh, uh, some smart home options with cameras like you, the IoT LAN is where home assistants should live. Um, no, and I don't have home assistant IoT uh, LAN. Do you have any rules sub PC to allow your home assistant to talk to the camera LAN? If you do, what do you do in automations and home assistant and cameras and LAN? And that's a, the way you do that in, in home assistant. And let me pull up my PF sense because I could just show the rules. But when I do my home assistant video, this is the part I probably should dive into a bit. You end up creating very specific rules to allow traffic across here. So let me get finding the spot they're asking for. And it's this rule right here. Let me just uh, share this tab and edit the rule. So the camera land blocks internet access. But um, if the source is 192.168.60.15, the Synology NVR specifically, and the destination is 172.16.16.12, that's my home assistant on my other LAN. If that's the source and this is the destination, we're going to allow it to pass the traffic. Now, I could go further in this and say, hey, instead of protocol any, I could limit the protocols, but I don't. Uh, whoops, I didn't pull that up. Um, but right here is the whole rule set. I'm saying that my Synology, and I, I do this because there's more things. I could get more granular, but I'm not worried about it much. My Synology is allowed to talk to Home Assistant. And because it's allowed to talk to Home Assistant, it's, I you know, someone could call me out on this. I should narrow it down to uh, TCP, 
and then port 80. So it's only because it does web hooks. Uh, that's the part it needs to talk to. Actually, I think there's two things it talks to. I'd have to sort out what ports it's using and I could add them in there. Uh, I did leave it at any because I'm just not, this is not my huge worry um, in terms of uh, security, but my Synology is allowed to talk to my home assistant. This is how they communicate. And this is what allows my home assistant to be able to easily uh, see things like all my uh, cameras and it's able to turn my lights on and off and it's able to create actions on this. So uh, you just create a rule from, you know, to allow from one spot to the other spot. That's what solves that problem. Good evening. I've run into issues on PF Sense after Kavir kept portal. I couldn't make WhatsApp call. Any solution to that? Um, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to make a WhatsApp call. My guess is you would have to authenticate it through the captive portal and something wasn't authenticated. Um, not really sure. I so rarely use, I hate captive portals. They're a pain. They're always causing problems. Uh, they're just one of those things you spend a lot of time troubleshooting. There's not like an easy snap my fingers type of answer with captive portals. And you are right. Jim Salter always sounds exasperated when he's discussing email hosting. Yes, anyone, including myself, who's done email hosting or Jay from Learn Linux TV, we are exasperated because we have dealt with so many problems, the email hosting. It's pretty much come down to Google and Microsoft do email hosting. Google controls the consumer market with Gmail. Microsoft controls the biggest part of the business market with their Office 365. Everything else in between is some level of disaster and whether or not you're big enough to mitigate it and have somebody you know at Microsoft unblock your domain. Um, that is just where the problem is. Google has some of the same issues. Once someone gets on a spam list, you might be there and then you have the email blacklist checkers and things like that. So uh, dealing with email is exasperating. That's, that's just the way to describe that. I thought about doing a video on it. I can't decide if it's actually good for the community or not for me to do it. I would just end up ranting about what a headache it is. Like, do I invite that drama into my life? That's the real question uh, about the email stuff. Uh, it's a mess. Um, the next question was about the Zima board we have. We have a Zima board. I'm running TrueNAS on there. I'm working on a video for it. Uh, but someone had asked. They said, hey, Tom, you know, what about putting uh, best way to set up SSD for cache drives on that. If you are thinking you're going to get performance out of a Zima board, you're not. Matter of fact, the Zima board only has two and a half gig ports in it. You're not going to get performance out of it. Uh, that I wouldn't waste the money on cache drives. You could put the money towards a used server um, that has some cache drives in it. So I don't think the Zima board will be the performance or ideal performance situation uh, for TrueNAS. So yeah, that other question, I mean, hey, I get it. It sounds like a good idea. Also, cache drives on ZFS. Um, I've got a whole video called Demystif... Uh, there was write-ups that started called Demystifying the Cache. I have, like, it says, like, ZFS Cache Explained, I think is what I titled my video. There's so much nuance into the way the cache works. That's one of the things I try to tell people is, like, it's just not as simple as you might think it is. Therefore, you should really read into it before you waste any money. That Your best money on ZFS is always spent, first, on memory. Lots of memory. Then figure out how much storage you need. Then, then go back and figure out if there's still budget left for memory. If you want performance on ZFS, you throw memory at it. Now, this is where the mistake comes in, where people say ZFS is RAM hungry. I say, no, it is not RAM hungry. It is RAM efficient. It will use it if you give it to it. But if you don't give it RAM, it works fine. It'll keep plugging right along and you won't, won't have an issue with it. Um, have my system I like to log into that will pull up over here. We'll log into it here. Let's throw it back up on the screen. And look, look, I still have half a gig of my eight gigs free on a ZFS system, which by the way, this has um, 21 terabytes available. So it's, you know, I'm only using 17% of this. It's just a backup system. And you can run it on a low, low memory environment. It'll work. It just, it, it's not performance. If I want that data back, it's going to take a minute. It could take a lot of minutes to get the data off, but I'm fine. It's, uh, it backs up all my videos. If it takes several hours to get my videos back, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's not a, not a huge problem. That's something I'm worried about. Um, 
I, I'm just comfortable knowing that the data is there and I have access to it if I need to. Um, of note, what do we got here? Let me see if I can pull this one up. Um, boom. So I am running now. Pull this tab up. The latest version of PF Sense 2305 release. I was already running the beta and uh, it was working great. So I went ahead and loaded this one. I'm working on a video for it, but I'm pretty happy with it. So I, it's been, you know, came out just the other day. I've only had it running here for 11 hours, but I was on the beta before. So not, not many bugs to report. You have eight gigs with your network there. Well, it's only a one gig connection on that. So the, the bigger challenge is getting data off here. One, it's only got four drives in it. And those four drives are not particularly fast. Combine that with the uh, network connection in this is, you know, it's it's got a um, one gig interface. So with, with only a one gig connection, I'm limited. Like even if I had a faster connection, I'd run into the limits with the, how fast the drives can serve it up. So it's going to take a while to copy the data, but I'm not worried about that. Like it's going to copy how it copies. And, you know, if I have a catastrophic failure of my flash system, then I'll eventually have it all restored. Um, it just won't be restored fast, but I don't really need it restored fast. Most, the majority of my videos, once I'm done with them, these go in the archive. So if for some reason, and there's also a cloud copy of them as well, but the way it works is I have active projects on a flash array. Um, then I, slowly migrate old projects to spinning rust systems. And it's not often I want, I don't know what to do with all of them. Like I, I haven't often referenced any of my old footage and I'm kind of debated about like, Hey, do I need to keep any of this? Like, should I get rid of uh, some of this old footage? And uh, until then, because I'm not out of space, I'm going to keep storing the footage until I'm going to be forced to deal with the problem and then probably just purge it. Because what am I going to do with the extra B-roll from a four-year-old project? Like, I don't need it that much. And a matter of fact, I usually, because I already pulled the best of the B-roll into the main project, um, I would probably just reference the video again if I wanted something out of it. So um, in all the years I've been doing YouTube now, so I've got, so 2017 is when I built the studio. So let's say roughly from 2017 on forward, that is six years now of data and I've not referenced it, but just a couple times. So six years of data with only a couple times referenced, I'm probably not too worried about it. <laughs> not, not really a big deal. So I'm like, yeah, you know, nothing, nothing too uh, concerning. On to another topic, and uh, let's talk about cybersecurity again. I'm doing another talk, so I thought I'd pull this up. Actually, there's a couple things we can talk about here. Get them all queued up. But this one here, I'm just going to zoom in, share the tab. Um, I'm doing another talk on, it, it's a fun talk. It's called Code of Armor, Building Resilience. Uh, against cyber threats for developers. So I put this together and what's going to be is me talking about the targeting of supply chain developers. And I'm going to be doing this as a private talk. But even when I do a private talk, because I like to have a lot of resources for people to read further, you know, all the sources I built the talk with and other times their suggestions in order to level up your understanding of a security topic. Uh, but I posted this here and I can drop a link for anyone interested copy link to post and throw it in here. There we go. Um, if anyone wants to comment or throw ideas out there, so I, I do these because I very much believe I am not the smartest person. I very much believe I'm smart because I interact with the community and I'm always trying to be around people smarter than me who might have answers to questions like this uh, and I can put the talk together. So uh, I know what I am going to talk about. I have quite a bit, but I always, you know, sometimes there's that little nugget I get handed by someone, uh, that little, you know, extra thing. And I'm doing this in the, in a, a couple of weeks. The talk itself is for a private event, but the... Um, I still want to make it publicly available. If I take the effort to put something together, even if it's for a private event, uh, unless they pay me for exclusivity at the event, which just doesn't happen. Uh, but if it's if it's one of those things I can put out there and then do a YouTube video where you can get educated too for all the time I put into it, absolutely. Um, 
I want to make sure I can share that information out there. Did you get a chance to play with uh, Ethernet Fire Fire Ethernet Firewall? If this firewall is like a book communications within the same VLAN, so you can't. Um, hold on, before you do that, I'll add context to it. But keep all your old footage. I know. I, I think about it. I, I think it's a good idea, but we'll figure that out. Let's talk about this other question you asked here because there is a lot more to this. One, that won't work, and it's kind of a fundamental for how networks work. But we did turn this on. I believe I have it turned on. Let me see if I have it turned on in this system. We do. So we can show it. So this is a new feature of um, PFSense. Because this is the new 2305 version. And what we have here is a need to zoom in. There we go. Ethernet rules. You're like, great. I can now control. Specifically, we'll look at like if we would the lab 101, we'll grab that. So this interface direction, in or out protocol. We're going to look for an IPv4 protocol. Source, single host, destination. And what these are is layer two filtering. This is a new feature they added. But the question you asked is, can it do enter VLAN? And the answer is no. It does not, it doesn't block things within the same VLAN or LAN. Really, you're you're saying subnet. VLANs are a logical way to break things up, whether, you know, so you can take one piece of cable and have multiple subnets on it. VLANs is a methodology to do that. But the problem is, if you look at it from the broadcast domain, when something's in a subnet, what does that mean? It reaches the gateway if the request, which thus in this case, the PF sense is the gateway, it reaches out to the gateway when the other devices are not on that same subnet. So if we're both in the same subnet and I have an IP address of 192.168.1.8 and you're 1.10 and PF sense is 1.1, it doesn't have to ask the gateway. It knows you're in the same subnet. Therefore, it's going to talk directly to the other person. PFSense has no effect on that. So this won't help you at all in terms of if it's on the same VLAN or if it's on the same LAN or the same subnet, however you want to word it. Uh, but that's just not going to be any different. They will not be able to uh, do that. This is for... It has to go like through and route through the PF sense for this rule to apply. I've played none with this. This is not a feature that I, I find it interesting that they're developing it. I don't think it's often I get a request for it. So yeah, that's um kind of a kind of one off one. So Hi, Tom. For Wi-Fi security, would you best use w 2 8 for each user or simply WP personal, but with enforcing SSL VPN and 2FA access to general resources? Um, I don't understand where the VPN comes in at all. Like, you want a VPN inside your network? I don't I don't understand. Uh, I, I maybe, I'm missing the use case for that of VPN. I mean, you someone asked me if you can encrypt all the traffic even inside the network, and like you can VPN inside of a network, it's possible. Um, it's not likely something someone would do, but in terms of Wi Fi security, you yeah, I mean, the thing about when you use WPA and you have a good password for it. It's not arbitrary to crack, despite what somebody may tell you that it's crackable. Anything is crackable at some point. If you do WPA Enterprise with certificates, now they need more pieces to get onto your network. But is that what you're trying to protect? This is um, where I kind of got to do a video on essentially zero trust, what it means and how people get that wrong. You want a VPN to secure... Uh, authentication for users leaving the enterprise. Like you, I, I still VPN to secure authentication, you leaving the enterprise leaving like they're, you, you want them to use a VPN to get outbound connections. Um, it sounds like a really complicated setup, and I'm not sure this is where I'm not sure what threat you're trying to mitigate against. This is also one of those things 
where if you operate and build your network under essentially what's like an assumed breach model where being on my network doesn't matter much. Matter of fact, being on my network, I mean, I'd ask how you got there, but if you're there, you're not exactly just getting into everything. If you hit my, like there's no known vulnerabilities right now in TrueNAS, for example. So let's say you're on my network. You can hit my TrueNAS, but you need a vulnerability to do it. And unless you have one ready, um, well, you don't. So, um, with P with a PSK, users leaving the enterprise would be able to connect to the Wi-Fi unless you rotate the PSK. Your your goal is to get rid of the users when they're not like. So you want to have someone leave. They, they leave the company and you want them not on your Wi-Fi anymore and you don't want to have to change passwords. That would be a, a use of using like the PSK and that authentication. Like <clears throat> large company has an SSID. You have to set certificates up and that way you can, you know, have a per user certificate. That way you can revoke said user who no longer works here. Now you can remove their certificate. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. I mean, VPNing seems like a more complicated way to do it. Most of the, the, some of the large companies that use it, like places my wife has worked. Um, the, the thing they usually do is the certificates are installed on the laptops that are, per, or whatever the computers are, the equipment supplied by the uh, company. They, they have them. My wife's laptop is, you know, she works for a large bank. So she, her laptop is very locked down. You can't even ping in on the network. So if they, you know, get, rid of or she quits the job or turns that laptop in um you can't extra, you could extract stuff on there but there's a key and everything's assigned to her that laptop's assigned to her and that's what locks it down it all depends on how you do your application authentication you know some companies just have a big wi-fi because they don't care because it doesn't really matter the wi-fi is not the method by which you get on the things and this is also where um i just met with the company today and they're rolling out a trust system based on using it with tail scale and because they're tagging the devices. So users are going to get ACL tags and tail scale to assign them resources or building out the infrastructure for this. So you basically the user is then assigned certain tags. Like you're allowed to operate your tag says you can get to this server, this server, because these are the privileges you need for your job. And the way you do that then is it doesn't matter as long as they have internet, they're now, then tagged, and then it brings them to the authentication of each of these servers. But there's different ways of doing it. It's just a matter of figuring out exactly what the goal is um, when you're doing it. And, and what's manageable. That's always what the, it all comes down to what's manageable. Uh it's always, always the fun with all this stuff. What you can do, what you can do well. Next topic, besides the security one and the PF Sense one, let's bump over to this real quick because I think this is cool. Now, this shows just a mature company in terms of the way they're doing it. These are the, the, the people over at XCPNG, the team at Vates, and this is a dev blog update. Unleashing the power of a unique atomic design system. And what they've done is, They've really sat down and came up with a standardization for how they're going to roll the design out for XCPNG and XO Lite. So they're adopting color scheme, color schemes for light mode, color scheme for dark mode, putting it all together, setting all the buttons. You you build out this is like here's all the elements that are a standard and are guidelines for our developers. Once you have all this set, it's just really nice UI stuff. Now we can start looking at how they're going to build out the tree, how they're going to build out each one of these, how the UIs are going to look for it. And uh, it's just, I can't wait for the new version. I'm just like so happy with the way all this looks. It's such a nice modern design. And it looks okay in light mode. I think it looks amazing in dark mode. So I'm really like, they're just doing a nice job on that. It's, uh, this was just announced, I think today, they dropped all of this on here, but yeah, it's just really cool to see uh, where they're coming along with it, how they're doing the design. So that's another thing I'm just excited about 
um, this project is really like from when it started, it's, it was pretty cool. It's become not just like a good way to manage virtual infrastructure, but it's become a easier way to manage it. It's become a, a good UI experience, which who thought, you know, hats off to Unify. Unify created such a good experience with network management, and now we're seeing virtualization experience, and I'm seeing awesome UIs for this. I think this is just really neat to see all these pieces come together like that. It's just really cool. Hi, Tom. Thanks for making some amazing TrueNAS content. I have a TrueNAS on a single SSD right now. Can I create a mere boot pool without reinstalling TrueNAS? Um, if you look, there's a uh, write-up on it. I've never done it, but there's a, there's an instruction how to add a boot mirror after the fact. I've never done it, though. So um, the... Uh, the trickiness is it, it's kind of risky to do. The easy answer, though, is to grab a boot pair, install them, re, you know, grab your backup file, the, the config backup, then reload PFs, uh, reload TrueNAS on the new setup boot pair, and then restore your config file. And that's another way to do it. That way it works. I, I think the other way, there's a way you can take and join something in to do it. I don't remember. There's a process someone has written up in the forums on that. You don't like the PF Sense. You think it needs a new UI. The UI and PF Sense is one of those things. It's people would be angry if it changed, but new users always are like, "Hey, I like to see a new UI." So I kind of get it. Like, it's it's a it's not the most intuitive from day one. Uh, and I'll even complain about this right here under diagnostics. If I want to reboot it, why is that under diagnostics? What if I want to shut it down? Why is it called halt system? It should be under system, right? That makes sense, but it's not. So I uh, there's things I could certainly could see to be improved, but it's not, I think, where they're focusing their time. And there's a lot of challenges uh, with firewalls. And the more complicated you end up making certain things or take you end up taking away from something else. There's a finite amount of developers on there. And I think that's just where the challenge, they don't have um, a UI designer who can jump in. Yeah. I, and I think if, you know, if they, if I were to suggest, if I, if I were waving the magic wand of where the money goes for development you might say, hey, that thing Travis says right there, a uh, dashboard would be nice. And I know that they're working on it. This is, a, this is something that's in the works. Well, if you go into the no UI route, there's Vios. MakerTick has a terrible UI, which makes you use. Why does Maker, MakerTick have a UI? I don't know. I'm, that's a different problem. Um, but nonetheless, there's... Definitely, um, there's always room for improvement, but it is the challenge of where do I allocate the money? This is this is not, they don't have unlimited funds. You have a finite amount of resources. You know, I, business is really playing any of those, you know, real-time strategy games with limited resources. That's running a business. The resources are never infinite. You have to try to bet on certain aspects of it. And hopefully you're doing things right that will progress the project forward and the users forward on it and figuring out a way to keep the funding going and the popularity of the project. And somewhere in between, you hope you don't get attacked from a security vulnerability uh, because you didn't put enough effort in one specific aspect of it. To be honest, there are no good or bad UIs, just ones you're not used to. Oh, no, no, there's definitely, definitely bad UIs. There's there's so many bad UIs. <laughs> there's, there's, we, we're seeing an improvement, but UIs are definitely, there's some of them that are, if you've worked in the uh, enterprise IT space and some of that software, it was not designed by people who thought about UX design at all. Yeah, that, there's a lot of bad UIs. Um, how are there so few vulnerabilities to open VPN on PF Sense? Those few patches, while other vendors like Fortinet have lots of phones. Is it the power of free BSD? No. So there's a bigger challenge. First, um, for a number of years, Fortinet has just been 
had some really bad coding practices. And this is this is at the heart of the problems. When you don't have developers who are thinking security minded, because the underlying of many of these firewalls are still Linux OSs or BSD. There are a lot of open source tools cobbled together in order to do it. But some companies choose to use open source tools as they are. Other companies go, I can't let the world know I'm using, you know, this uh, VPN that might be open VPN. I must sprinkle my magic upon it and my magic upon it will make it so feature rich and stupid. Oh, wait, we didn't think about security, did we? We just wanted it to be magic and better than like just an open source project. And then we've now injected a bunch of, um, uh, you know, just mess around it. It's just, it's so stupid. Uh, and FortiGate has been at the top of uh, that. So it's just, yeah. Talking about bad UI, did you have any ugly 90s website? Yes, I did. Man, I'm not telling you what it is, though. That's that's a project because I imagine it's findable with the Wayback Web Machine if you can figure out what the website was. Um, that's an OSINT challenge. If you can solve that puzzle, what Tom's the oldest website for Tom, and uh, it's not thomaslawrence.com. It's uh, I, I own that domain, but that's not the old one. Um, it wasn't GeoCities either. I had a domain. I, my first domain, I think I bought in 95 or 96. It's the first time I bought a domain. Um, so if, if you're good at open source intelligence, when did I buy Thomas Lawrence? There's, there's a trivia question. I don't even have the answer to, cause it was not the first domain I bought. So let me, let's pull who is real quick. Who is thomaslawrence.com and when did he buy that? Does it even does it have the original date in here? 2001. So yeah. Creation date 2001. So I did buy that one back then, but yes. Definitely Tom there. Was it about my truck? No, it was a nerd site. Uh it was not there was the truck I what is the truck I had back then? That would be the real Do I have a picture of one of my old trucks? Maybe not. Yeah, I'd have to dig through the history to try to find that. Somewhere, somewhere, one of my old trucks. <laughs> what truck did I have back then? Actually, I have a I have a picture of one of my trucks that got wrecked. <laughs> yeah, the um somewhere. Hold on, if it might be worth no. Thought I had a picture. I have a picture of my daughter uh and me when we built one of my trucks. This is my this is a picture I had for a while. There it is. There we go. We'll throw that picture up there. This is 2003 when me building a truck and my daughter playing with a screwdriver. So, yes, I did have a bunch of old trucks. I used to build hot rods back then out of trucks and things like that. So that was. <laughs> I had a I had an orange truck. So. Yeah. The um, the different all the fun vehicles I had, I thought I had a picture of the orange one. It's it's buried somewhere. The orange truck was after that truck. So many fun things. Looking, thought I had it. Maybe not. Oh, there it is. That was the other, this is what that, so you start with that mess you see, and then later you go and you build something that looks like this um, when it's done. So. Yeah, those are those are the projects Tom used to do before. Well, I'm still doing tech. The tech is what funded all that because those are expensive projects. Uh, do you still rock a Lenovo laptop and a Pixel phone? Pixel phone, yes, but I went with the Dell laptop and I don't remember the model. It's the Dell laptop that has the OLED screen. I went with it because the OLED screen. 
works really well. Hey, just want to say hi, Tom. Thanks for your videos uh, about your and crash cameras. I'm super happy with them. It's a little funny that my robotic lawnmower sometimes detected as human. There's a cat that the Amcrest, not every time, but once a week, there's a cat that gets detected as a human. Um, I don't know why. I don't, the cat just, it gets in the right position in the driveway and it's like human detected. And uh, when a human is detected in my driveway or a vehicle, the uh, Amcrest cameras trigger home assistant to turn all the lights on. So uh, that cat gets scared off because the cat, the cat doesn't like when all the lights come on. So, but yes, that's the thing. That is a challenge that happens. Probably have a video of it somewhere I can share, but it's definitely, it's the one downside of those is you get, you get some of that. Let's see if we go to the recordings. And we look for, uh, what is it called? Advanced event. That's how they refer to it. And then the camera is going to be driveway. And we'll look for the cat. This time it was a bird. I don't, I don't know whether, I don't see a person. But see how the lights came on? The lights came on because it thinks there's a person. It said there's a person. This bird apparently. But the birds are there all the time. They don't set it off every time. But this particular time, the birds set it off. Because you notice there's not there's not that many events that are at night. Because the night's the only time I... Um, looking for it. So here's another one. This was what? 518. Oh, this was actually me coming home. So there's not that many. It is. I know the cat, if I turn into like motion events, the cat's there more often. Uh, we have a few yard cats that just kind of wander around. No, that's me. Someone's actually me. Yeah, so there's not many of them. Hey, there's me loading motorcycles. Camera, I almost, yeah, just, okay, I went in there pretty easy. <laughs> so it's still human shape shifted as a cat. Now, if there was six cats, that's a whole different thing. So if it was cat six. <laughs> um, No, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to get Amcrest cameras working with Unify Protect. Unify exclusively works with Unify. And Unify cameras technically can work with a Synology that can be made to happen, but the Unify cameras, or the Unify NVR only accepts and connects to, there might be some hacky way someone made it work, but I'm not aware of any. Um, it's not designed to do it at all. As part of the way they uh, designed it was just to really keep you in their ecosystem. The cat story is absolutely hilarious. I went from having several hundred motion detections, alarm, false alarms from the main station to finally being able to use the notification system itself. You can probably, the cat thing doesn't happen, but maybe once a week. The cat goes by more than once a week. It's part of its track. It goes between my yard and the neighbor's yard and another neighbor's yard. Um, but it's only once while it gets detected human. What you can do is inside of each of the MCARS cameras is you can go through and fine tune the settings to try to eliminate false positives on it. So there's ways to tune it to make it better that hopefully help. But overall, it's a um, it's just kind of tricky. It's it's mo it's just not too big of a deal is how, really how I feel about it. Um, one, that once in a while notice I get like, hey, whatever. As I don't want to make it too not sensitive where if someone's in the driveway and it doesn't do it. But so far, I don't know where that threshold is because right now the threshold is pretty, you know, for, still pretty low. I, I have plenty of room to go up. It, it never not detects a person. So anytime there's a person uh, in the driveway, it always sets off a detection. It's very consistent that people and cars, it it's never missed on. But I don't want to tune it up to the point where, you know, it it's uh, like that percentage or whatever scoring system it uses uh, eventually tells me when there's no person in there. That would be bad. That would that would defeat its purpose altogether. All right. Did I get any more emails? Because I'm going to wind it down here if I don't have any more. All right. 
We do have some feedback on the home lab show too. I got a similar bucket for that. Me and Jay, um, we just didn't have time to do a few of the home lab shows because I happen to be traveling on Wednesdays, like when I was for MSP GeekCon. So uh, because of some of my travel schedule, I won't be able to do that. But good day there. Just upgraded to True Dance Scale. Had to set up some apps in uh, apps with VLANs. Hard to set up apps with VLANs. Oh, yeah. Is it hard? Yes. Uh, they don't make that easy. I'm throwing that out there. I don't even have a video on it as a topic. I'm going to wait till it gets a little bit more interface stable, and then I'll do that as a topic. But right now, no. Um, it's it's challenging. We'll just say that. There's also, let me see if I can find this article, because I thought this was interesting. This was posted the other day. And this kind of... Uh, Let's see if we can find this by searching 2023. Uh, let me think. Tools. Past week. What? Uh, I think this might be it. And what I want to do is cover some of the problems I've run into uh, about this. So people were complaining about this a lot, the true NAS scale and the, NAO, the number of people that want to talk to me about on RAID. And I just don't use it. I don't have anything against it. Use it if it makes you happy. But one of the things I noticed was in, in this is right here from this article. This was a comparison of unraid versus true NAS. Uh, and pricing both NAS and most concern for factors for consumers in regards to true NAS, a better choice. True NAS core version, open source and completely free design for the home users demand storage. Of course, there are two versions requiring some prices with our services. You can choose them based on your demands. And maybe this isn't the one. This sounds like a copy of the other one. And one of the problems they had was they actually said you had to pay for true NAS scale. That's not true. And that was where some of the, um, aggravation I have with all these articles that pop up is the number of inaccuracies. It's kind of annoying to me. Um, that's why I've been trying to make those charts when I compare things. And I, I don't know that I want to do one for Unraid. Unraid technically is a closed source paid product. It's not, I, I think Unraid's pricing, let me look at how much Unraid costs. Unraid cost. I think their pricing is cheap. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not some crazy pricing. So fifty nine dollars, uh, you get to try for thirty days. Eighty nine dollars for twelve of stat short bases. One twenty nine for unlimited. Um, buy once, use for life. It's a, it's not a subscription. It's a one time fee to use it. I think their pricing is very reasonable, you know, and things like that. But it's just weird for the you know the article to talk about the one I'd popped up because it got suggested in my little news feed. You know, I, I look at the news feed on my phone once in a while and it has different suggestions for things. And I was like, man, this article is just wrong. And I think that's either a, they're having these garbage AI systems, write These articles, but I've seen this repeated before where they keep saying true NAS scale costs money. It doesn't true NAS core and true NAS scale. You can download for free. Um, true NAS enterprise is a, same version, but basically you're buying enterprise support. You're buying a support package and you don't have to buy it, but enterprises do get it. So there's a cost for that, but it's called TrueNAS Enterprise. And, and you would probably assume by its name, TrueNAS Enterprise, that it's a paid version. Like if you were just guessing, if I laid the three versions out, TrueNAS Core, TrueNAS Scale, TrueNAS Enterprise, which one of these three do you think costs money? And you would probably guess right. Yeah, so Unraid is uh, priced here based on number of storage devices. Yeah, it's not. I don't think the pricing's bad on it. I don't have anything against the way they price. I think they're very reasonable. Um, but I don't. It, I don't use it. It doesn't have the performance of TrueNAS, and I'm just not worth. It's not worth it to me to go try to take a time to learn it either. <laughs> Having more options for self-hosted non-cloud is good in my book. Oh yeah, yeah. I. 
the, the thing is, people are always asking me to do videos on it. I'm like, I just don't have time. I don't use it, and I don't have a use case for it. And I already know there's someone else who does videos on it because they do. Matter of fact, there's a few people, not just one person. There's several, there's several people who already have videos on Unraid. In you know, they seem popular. They have a decent amount of views. I'm like, then they're they have a good community for them. So yes. Have you seen the new Ingenious on controller software? They're becoming more like Unify every day called Ingenious Fit on Prem. Um, an Ingenious is hot garbage. So we, we've looked at that. And we looked at the first version, the second version. I, I, I quit looking at it because it was so poorly written. I'm like, I get what they're trying to do. But here's an example. So Ingenious sends me a switch. I tried to review the switch, but I find the documentation bad. I talk to them. I tell them what's wrong and what needs to be corrected in our documentation. They choose not to correct it. Then I do. I go ahead and do the review, make snide comment of, I. they have the settings wrong. Here's how you set them up right. And by the way, from the product was sent to me, I did the review within a month or two because I wanted to actually use it for a little while. So I stuck it in some stuff I was doing in my lab. Then they discontinued the product. Who sends a new product to someone and then discontinues it ingenious does that's who um i don't get it i don't trust that they have a solid plan so i wouldn't want to bet anything on their equipment um i i you know i feel like they're well intended but disorganized so i might be fine for home users but i certainly would not want to bet anything on it any decent videos on PFSense and IPv6? Not from me. I don't use IPv6. AI firewall optimized software. That sounds like someone's pitch to get money. I don't think there's anything practical about that yet. I've not seen anything that would make me want something like that. Um, I mean, I've seen people who tell me, I, I'm positive there's a bunch of enterprise companies that haven't, auto learning AI firewall that magics the packets to make you more secure. I don't think I've seen anyone actually do anything that truly magics the packets and to make you more secure. You've used un Unraid for years. It's great for what it does. Simple, flexible NAS. Sim, sim, ah, run out of words here. Simple and flexible NAS with decent app container support. It's not an enterprise NAS by any means, but it isn't meant to try and be that. Yeah, I, I mean, they really do target the home user market, which is fine. They made an affordable NAS that is expandable for home users. Hoorah! That's a good. That's a good thing to have in the market space. I just don't need that particular thing for me personally. But that's why I tell people I don't know any reason for you not to use it. I don't think it's a bad product. It's not like a Zyxel. <laughs> it's it's not like I'm, they they're not in the news for a security vulnerability every day. They're not QNAP who also has security problems constantly. So, yeah. Happy and number space saying unifies equipment. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. The the unif the I, I want to like ingenious stuff. I mean, they, they had a few things at a good price point. The weirdest thing is, here's a here's an ingenious story. They mailed me another switch, and I've not heard anything back from them. We went to test it, and then we were we've been scratching our head because it's not listed anywhere. You can't buy it. So I kind of said, why would I review this when nobody, nobody, not even Amazon has it? And the people who have it are some of the suppliers, and I say kind of have it, they have a listing for it. It's so expensive, it makes no sense. The product is so overpriced, but it always says out of stock, so it's kind of moot point. So I don't know if that price is what it's supposed to be. And she just doesn't have a price on their website for it, but yeah, they sent it to me. I never reviewed it because I'm like, why would I review something no one can have? And if they did decide they wanted it, there's a one website that listed it, but it also doesn't appear to ever be in stock and it's also double the price of anything similar in the market um it's so expensive it's it's almost three times what ubiquity costs for the similar switch so i don't like i don't understand ingenious like they just mailed it to me like well they, they said hey do you want to switch do you want to review a switch i said yes and they sent it to me so there was some back and forth but when i got it i'm like when's this going to be available somewhere and i don't think they ever replied and i never reviewed it uh, as far as a meeting that would not end, did you already read blogs? There's the email about Zima boards. Yes, I did. 
I don't think you're uh, barking up the right tree if you want to put SSD caches on a Zima board for performance. The Zima board is not going to be your performance choice. Um, that's just the bottom line. It's not going to have enough memory to do anything performance oriented when it comes to that. So could you put them on there? Sure. Would you want to? I don't know that it's the most effective use of money. Uh, your money would be better spent upgrading to a more complete system uh, for NAS rather than trying to stick money into uh, SSD. Now, from a learning experience, the Zima is fun uh, and learning what happens when you remove a drive assigned to cache. That could be fun. Um, but from a performance standpoint, I mean, it's just not that fast. So not where, not where you'd waste the money for performance on that. So we did cover that. Um, was there anything else anyone had? Any any other things before the class, before Tom winds it down? Because I'm out of water. I have some videos I want to actually sit and record, the updated PFSense. Because there's a few more things I want to talk about with PFSense 2305. Um, that, for the, I mean, the, I've only found one thing that make. and I'll throw this out there. So, you, you know, the, those of you that are watching that are curious about this if there's any reason not to upgrade to it. And the only thing I found exclusively is this, and it's going to be, let me get this pulled up. It may, it may be fixed by now because this is from this morning. Let's uh, this, share this tab, and we'll read together and see if it's fixed. Apparently, uh, syslog ng is broke. That's the only thing I know of that's broken the 2305 version. We've updated a few systems. Uh, actually, it's fixed. So, all right. Oh, so they if I so this is already even fixed. So the one which is one of the reasons I waited to do the video because they're actively working on stuff. And when there's not many bugs or and they're kind of they're really minor, they're small changes. So even this one, uh, which was a syslog ng bug, has been fixed. So awesome. I love the unified product software wonder uh, for good quality products that need frequent updates. I get the part for updates for feature enhancements, bug fixes, and whole patches. Yeah. Uh, there's just, there's a lot of feature. There's so many edge cases when you're producing the, at the scale Unify does. So they're, Unify is actually pretty good about, I would say, there's always some bug fixes. It's just the nature of writing complicated software. There's always a level of bugs that are in there and you're just going to have that. That's just uh, the nature of it, but they're always pushing forward for better features. So that's also why there's a lot of updates. What am I going to start the Unreal server? Eventually, maybe one day. I don't know. I've been so busy. I haven't had time to play games. Pizza for Marcus. Me and Marcus had pizza. Um, that's why I vlog Thursdays late. If I compare Ubiquiti Press Cisco boxes, which don't need IOSA as frequent, can you comment on that? Um, yeah, Cisco, Cisco is probably a little bit less frequent because they're not they're not pushing more features into their boxes. That's probably the biggest reason because the bigger list from Ubiquiti is usually feature updates more so than it is um, bug fixes. They're just trying to get new features uh, all the time. Now, part of it's their own fault. And when I say their own fault, this is a complaint I had. Like their VPN, they could have put normal VPN from day one, but they chose not to. And by choosing not to put normal VPN in, there's been a ton of updates to essentially bring it back to normal VPN. And I don't know why. Like why why did it take them so long to do this? I don't have a clue. Um, but they did. So it's like I'm happy. They they've come around to it. They said, you know. We're going to do things normal. We're going to go with a normal VPN here. Um, so there's a lot of updates that brought us to that. Uh, thanks. Enjoyed listening a while. Uh, I was adopting Ubiquiti 24 port PoE switch to my home network. You know, something else worth noting, if you look at the Unify updates, because they're doing everything in a centralized controller that Cisco doesn't offer in a coherent way, that's a big piece of it because it's all centralized and there's so many things that are updated off that one controller software. There's always going to be more updates because there's so many things connected to it. So that also drives more updates. Any updates you can share on the zero? Um, it hasn't exploded. I think that's an update. Um, it works. I 
haven't really done anything else with it. I let it run for a little while just to see if it crashes. Um, but I've been too busy to actually test it because I've been I was I've been gone at events, uh, so I haven't really uh, done much to it. Greetings from Seattle. Awesome. Um, there's also uh, a few mini Ryzen systems that came in, and those are being tested by my staff. They, uh, they're they testing those out and playing with them. I mean, the staff set up the Zima board, too. It always creates opportunity for them to do things like that. So I have them, you know, poking away at it, getting things set up. It just helps me uh, get more done because that's kind of the, always the challenge. Thanks, you brought up some good points. Yeah, with the Unify stuff, like I said, they just... Let me, let's pull up, like, the latest um, Unify... What was it? 7.4s in release candidate. And if you look at... Um, it's mostly improvements, like... Port, they're, they're tuning this, making this better, improved uh, UX, added support with uh, IPDB, IGMP proxy, added hover over for network names. This is mostly added, 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 improved. So there's some uh, fixed gateway configuration or sign Ethernet port profile uh, with unsupported link speed. You know, edge cases, uh, fixed validation errors after auto scale networks. Uh, fix spam and trigger logs uh, caused by broadcast graphics. Interesting. So there's always little stuff. Fix unable to save firewall in rare cases. And part of my question for Cisco is, do they ever fix the bugs or do they just like, oh, the workaround is to just do this thing? You know, that's uh, a big, I don't know. Some companies just let you suffer through with quirky software. I am a, I'm transferring five gig movie files um, to my Zima board at 115 meg. Yeah, I mean it's fine for that. It's not going to be performance in terms of small writes, but for things like that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Cody knows because he covers all this stuff. You know, added an open VPN server. Like this is something that most every even DDWRT, all these other firewalls all have this and. I don't know why, but for reasons we can't quite understand on the roadmap of the world of ubiquity, they didn't. They did something different. And they eventually decided to do this. So I don't understand like what, what made them like do it the hard way. Like we're, we can't use normal open VPN. We have to completely come up with a, a different way of doing it that's different. We're innovative. We're so innovative. We don't use VPNs in normal ways. We're going to tie it to a cloud controller that you have to bounce off of that you log into the cloud controller to bring back the config from your firewall. Like why? Why'd you do it the hard way? <laughs> Yeah, Cisco does bug uh, fix bugs, but they usually do it as accumulated bug fix. Yeah, they do their roll-up patches and things like that. Up, I need to upgrade my Unify controller. I'm going to just write an Ansel playbook to install everything. Yeah. You can do it. You can automate the updates on there. There's, there's some scripts for it. They already exist, so you, you can create them yourself or you can uh, borrow somebody else's. The G4 doorbells in stock. That's interesting. I just don't have a use case for a doorbell. That's um, a few of my friends have asked me. I'm like, I just I don't, I don't have a doorbell. I, I have a camera that can see my um, porch, and I'm fine with that. Um, that's all I need. I never want to talk to anyone on my porch. I, the porch has intrusion detection, so I can just tell it to um, pull up the camera monitor. But yeah, I can just look at who's on my porch with the camera, and I'm fine with that. We'll pull it up in there. I like the package cam uh, at the base of the door. 
German Shepherds make for good doorbells. You're not wrong. Oh, look. I wonder if there's a package. Hey, look, a package. <laughs> like, I mean, I know when there's a package because I have a little, you know, I can get a notice um, when there's an intrusion detection on the porch. So, you, yeah, you set the intrusion detection system for that. Question, do you see a perceived uh, future that TP-Link, Omada, Unify Wannabe can gain more popularity in Ubiquity given they don't seem to have supply chain problems like Ubiquity does? Um, even Ubiquity supply chain problems are not that bad. Most of them now are demand instead of just being out of stock. I don't, I, TP-Link is kind of just a bad copycat. I don't really, I don't know. I don't get the right feel from them that they care about security, that they care about product life cycle. They just care about making something like Ubiquities and making it just a little bit cheaper. And uh, there's a, some weird, so we've had some consulting jobs because we know enough about them that we took on some consulting with them. There's some quirkiness with them. My network engineers, like, you know, when the rubber meets the road, they're like, these things have some bugs. And I forget what it was. And maybe Eric will come on sometime and talk about it. But there's definitely some solid goofed up bugs inside of uh, the TP link we've had to deal with. I have the door pro is way easier to do than try to wire a camera in that area of the house. Yeah, if you already have a doorbell, that's another thing. I, I ran a wire to this area of the house. So uh think your camera mic is on. Oh, you hear the chimes? <laughs> that's funny. We hear the cameras. <laughs> that's funny too. So we'll we'll stop sharing. We'll stop sharing that. So that's funny. Yeah, I can't hear it. It's really weird because it loops the audio in um, from the tabs I share, which is kind of funny. So, yes, I, I, I can hear who's on my porch, too, in case anyone's wondering. I can see who's on my porch. I can hear who's on my porch. I just don't have the two-way option to talk to who's on my porch, but I never want to do that anyways. I never want to talk to them. They can tap on the door all they want. I don't want to let them in, or I do want to let them in. So... It's I'm I'm simple like that. All right. Did I cover all the topics today? That's the question. So I can go back to I have a few more things to do. Yeah, it's funny because I see the sites muted, but I don't think that works. Oh, let's see. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Much appreciate all of you being here. It was great. Um, if maybe tomorrow, because I got a lot to do over the weekend, maybe tomorrow I'll do another live stream. Uh, I want to do a few more and I trying to figure out the best timing to do it. That's always a real challenge. When are people on if I do a live stream? Allegedly, Sundays when a lot of people are available, but I'm going to be out and about this Sunday. So Sundays have been hard because I'm trying to take the weekends off a little bit, but. Nonetheless, love hearing from you. Vlog Thursday at LawrenceSystems.com. And uh, if you want your questions read right on the air, that's where you send them to. You can always find me in the forums, forums.LawrenceSystems.com. In the meantime, thank you, everyone, for joining. It was awesome to chat with everyone. And uh, same time works. Same time works for the land down under. Yeah, time zones are fun. I got, you know, sometimes I got to shift up. Sometimes I can do it in the morning. Sometimes I do it in the afternoon. And uh, it's always fun. Oh, even Slagle is over here. So, all right, man. Thanks, everyone, and take care.